Good afternoon and welcome to our OBS online Bible study. It has been a while. I know, I know. It has been a while. But again, welcome and I'm glad to be back. Um, much that I would that we could have, if we could continue our broadcast or we could have broadcast last time. There were a lot of things that I need to attend to and all oh, these online classes and online studies giving us some headaches and most of the teachers are having some <laughs> nightmares and terrible times but we will get to this we'll 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 get through okay so let's go back now to romans chapter one and we'll be dealing with the book of romans and i i may for the time being be able to impart to you some of the verses i know it would take a lot of time for us to discuss the book of romans so as we have studied from past lesson that others consider the book of romans to be the most important letter ever written and some others believe that the book of romans alone or the book of romans itself is enough for one to read and find salvation is enough for one to to just have and enough the the details or the things that need to be known are there unto salvation that is an overextension so to speak yes it is the most important book ever written for some but it is not complete or it is not the gospel. It is not the only book needed for one to read to know all about salvation. Um, the gospels are there. And saying that, let's just move on. Let's just read the book itself. Okay? The book starts with chapter 1. And chapter 1, verse 1, here is our reading on that. Uh, my my clicker is not working okay so here is chapter one of the book of romans verse one taken from the english standard version it says paul a servant of christ jesus called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of god this is a letter again let me remind you that the book of romans is a letter written by Paul, Apostle Paul, to the saints who are in Rome, to the Christians who are in Rome. And what we have seen so far from our survey is that Paul has never been to Rome yet. Or Paul has not met the brethren in Rome yet. Okay? So, the style of writing as we could see it from Paul's letters or the Pauline epistles is that the author or the writer will always make himself known before his addressee. So it was needed for Paul to say, Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The verse 1 in itself is fully Loaded. Let us look at these things. When Paul called himself to be a servant, he takes himself everything that there is being a free man. Because a servant or a doulos in, in Greek means a slave. During these times, slaves have no rights for themselves. They are the property of the master they are at the master's own disposal they can not own anything they have no right for themselves but they are dependent upon their master whatever the master's will is that the slaves must obey so when paul introduced himself to be a doulos, to be a servant, 
of Christ. He is making known to the brothers, to the brethren in Rome, that he is a property of Jesus. And Rome being the capital of the empire knows and understands that. Rome being the center of the empire knew that because they must have had slaves for themselves or that they are aware of the things, okay? So the next one is that he made himself to be the sole property of Christ Jesus, not by any man but the sole property of Jesus. So, this is going to be an interesting book. Because a free man, a lawyer as such, a member of the Sanhedrin, a persecutor of the church, a man that is known among his peers to be above, to be way ahead of his generation, so to speak, now claims himself to be a slave and a property of Jesus or under his master's disposal. That's heavy stuff. The next one is that he uses the term apostle from the Greek apostolos. An apostolos or an apostle is someone sent with a mission. An envoy. Someone who is sent on official mission. I know there are a lot of people so hung up with the word apostle. There are even those who are teaching that they themselves are apostles. Okay? And... May mga pananampalataya nga magsasabing kailangan mga apostol ngayon. There needs to be a perpetuity of apostles. The Bible did not, uh, does not teach that. And they have this idea that if there will be no apostle, there will be no church that will be established. Walang apostol, walang iglesia. Ito pong aklat ng Roma ang magpapabulaan sa bulaang uh, claim na yan, sa mula ang turo na yan, sa maling turo at aral na yan. Kasi una sa lahat-lahat, ang iglesia sa Roma ay natatag na hindi sa pamamagitan ng apostol o kilalang tao na galing sa linya at galing sa grupo ng mga apostol, kundi natatag ng maaaring isa sa mga nakinig sa kanila nung panahon ng Pentecostes o isa sa mga nagsikalat dahil sa persecution na ginagawa nun ni Solo. O, oh, ito ngayong si Apostol Pablo. Having said that, kung niyo pong mga marapatin, balikan ninyo yung pagpili ng kapalit ni Judas, sinabi po ni Apostol Pablo, ang qualifications ng mga taong pwedeng hahalili kay Judas, yung kasama nila, naging eyewitness siya, nandun siya from the baptism of John, hanggang doon sa resurrection at ascension ng Panginoong Jesus. At matatagpuan po natin yan sa mga gawa. Having said that, let us move on. Ang susunod na salitang gagamitin niya is that set apart, meaning this, set apart, made exclusive, <laughs> made Apart, not common, not the same. So when Paul called himself to be a servant, a slave of the Lord, and was sent with a mission and being set apart, he remembers it well. He remembers it well and even will tell us the account on Acts chapter 9 in Acts 26. Even before the Roman officials, he would always say that of his Damascus incident wherein Jesus called him, setting him apart 
to be the apostles unto the Gentiles. Okay? So, let's move on. In verse 2 it says, Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Beforehand. He promised beforehand through his prophets. He promised beforehand that it should be in, in verse next verse concerning his son who descended from David according to the flesh. So it is all about Jesus. Paul being chosen to be a slave set apart and sent with a mission to the Gentiles will all be about Jesus. All the things that he will be dealing with is about Jesus. That is why when you come to uh, 1 Corinthians, he will always say, For I resolve to know nothing except Christ and Him uh, crucified. So those things are. So in verse 3, he made sure that he's being set apart, he's being sent, and he's being the sole property and the disposal of his master Jesus is for this. So concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and it brings to us Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So there it is. It links. And was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is heavy stuff. Not only was he made mention that the son descended from David according to the flesh, but the second one that um, Saul affirms is that he was declared to be the son of God, not only son of David according to the flesh, that is his human nature, but he was also the son of God in accordance with, according to the Holy Spirit, to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. The final proof of him being the son of God is that when he claimed just like in the prophecy the Lord says to my Lord the same by David the proof of his claim to be the son of God is there by his resurrection from the dead all his claims will be laid bare or will be laid for nothing or to naught. Had he not resurrected from the dead, lahat po ng sinabi niya that I am, lahat ng mga ego emi, I am. The way, I am the truth, I am the light, I am. The good shepherd, I am. And all of those I am will be nothing if death holds him in the grave, mawawalang saisay ang lahat-lahat ng claims ni Jesus. Mawawalang saisay ang lahat-lahat ng mga bagay-bagay na sinasabi niya patungkol sa kanya at patungkol sa kanyang ama. Mawawalang saisay yon kung nanatili siyang nakabaon doon sa kanyang libingan. Ang naging pinakamalaking patunay kung sino siya ay yung kanyang pagkabuhay na mag -uli. Yung kanyang pagpapakita that death has no power over him. Yung kanyang makikita natin that it goes back doon sa 3.15 yung first messianic prophecy sa Genesis chapter 3.15 na nung sabihin ng Panginoong Diyos that I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Yung offspring na pinag-uusapan doon ay patungkol sa Panginoong Jesus. 
yung bruising the head of the serpent. Ay yung kamatayan na idudulot niya or yung you shall bruise his heel, yung kamatayan na maibibigay ng jablo sa kanya by making him crucified. Pero ang matinding dagok ay yung pagkabuhay niya na maguli is just like crushing the head of the serpent na pagtagumpayan niya maging ang kamatayan. Okay? Let's move over to this, verse 4. The same thing, itong sinasabi niya, the Son of God, in power according to the Spirit of Holiness by His resurrection from the dead, it re-echoes also yung napag-usapan na natin, napag-aralan na natin doon sa sermon ni Pedro during the Pentecosts. When Peter said, Let all the house of Israel, chapter 2 verse 36 of Acts, Therefore, know for certain, walang pagdududa, know for certain, with certainty, with, wala talagang, uh, beyond the shadow of any doubt. Uh, ganun na lang sana sabihin natin legal term. Know for certain that God, the Son of God, God has made Him both Lord, Curious, and Christ, the Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Walang pag-aalinlangan. Sabi ni Apostol Pedro, kinawa talagang Panginoon at Kristo itong si Jesus na inyong ipinako sa cross. Nagjajay pang bawat isa. Nagsasama at nag nagkakaroon ng ng unawaan at nagkakaroon ng ugnayan ang mga bersikulong nababanggit. Okay? Verse na kasunod. Ito'y patungkol kay Kristo na gusto kong makita natin bago ko pumunta doon. Ano? Uh, yung pagiging anak ng Diyos, ng Panginoong Jesus, He was declared to be the Son of God. Sa ibang parte ng kasulatan na sinulat ni Apostol Pablo, siya pa rin ang may akda nito sa Filipos, Kabanatang 2, Talatang 5, hanggang pababa, napakaganda po nitong mga, mga versikulo o mga talatang ito na inyong titingnan na ating uh, hihimayin sumandali. Sabi niya doon, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Sana meron kayo nitong ganitong kaisipan, gayong kayo ay nakay Kristo Jesus. Though, nabagamat, even though, the top what, he was in the form of God. Maalala yung John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word was God. Ito siya. He was in the form of God. Hindi lang form. But John says, he was God from the very beginning. Pero ang gusto ko makita natin is that did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Ano mo ring isipan yan? He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But anong ginawa niya? He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Sa mga hindi naniniwalang si Kristo ay Diyos, magkaminsan ito yung pinag-uusapan natin at pinagdidebatihan na versikulo. Sa mga hindi naniniwalang si Kristo ay Diyos, or divine, or deity, ito lagi. Kung natagpuan siya sa anyong Diyos, ano siya? Kasi nung natagpuan siya sa anyong tao, to. Being found in human form, nung natagpuan si Jesus, sa anyong tao, ano siya? Tao. E nung natagpuan siya sa anyong Diyos, ano siya? Tao pa rin, ang kanilang isasagot. But then again, kapag ka maging honest nga po tayo sa pag-aaral ng mga bagay-bagay na ito, tanggapin natin kung ano nasusulat. So ulitin natin, He was in the form of God. So, what was He? John said, 
He was from the very beginning with God and He was God. He was in the form of God. But did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. When he took the form of a servant, being found in human form, that form of a servant there, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What a mighty God we serve. What a God he is. After he emptied himself, because if he stayed being God, paano mo ipapako? But he emptied himself and took the human form so that he can be obedient to the point of death. Even yung pinakamasaklap na uri ng kamatayan, yung ipapako ka sa cross. Na ang bukodanging pinapatawan ng ganitong uh, parusa ay yung pinaka sa lahat ng mga pinaka ng mga kriminal. Yet, he being perfect, he being faultless. When he took our sins, siya yung naging scapegoat natin. Siya yung nagdala ng ating mga kasalanan doon sa cross. But for that, for, for other uh, na pag-aaral na po ito, pero inuunahan natin. So, even that, death on the cross. Therefore, dahil sa ginawa niyang yon, kaya it goes back to Romans chapter 1 verse 5 or verse 3 and 4. Dahil sa ginawa niyang yon, dahil dito sa mga bagay-bayan na pag-uusapan, because of these things, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Purposely, so that, the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There it is. It goes back Romans chapter 1 verse 4. And here is now. Paul continue, continued saying, through whom we have received grace. We will be dealing a lot of these things. In the book of Romans, and even in Galatians, and some other books, we will be discussing Ephesians for that matter. We will be discussing a lot about grace. And we will deal a little bit longer on this. To know grace, grace is an unmerited favor. Grace is a gift. Grace is something not earned. Grace is freely given. Kaya mali yung sasabihin mong, nasaan ang regalo ko? So hindi na regalo yun kasi you're demanding a gift. Or kaya din hindi maintindihan ng mga kabataan magkaminsan what grace is, ano ang biyaya, ano ang gift, at ano ang reward. Sasabihin ng, ng mga magulang magkaminsan, o sige anak, magpagbutin mo pag-aaral mo, pagka may honors ka, bibigyan kita ng regalo. Hindi po regalo yon That's a reward. Kaya dito pa lang kailangan maintindihan natin, ang free gift is free gift. Unexpected. Ibinigay sa'yo, you don't deserve it. That's grace. But if you work for it, if you were conditioned, there are conditions to be met, there are things that you need to be doing to receive that, that's no longer a gift. That is a reward. Dapat ngayon pa lang maintindihan natin itong mga bagay-bagay na to. Sabi na po Sir Pablo, through whom, through Jesus, we have received grace. Undeserving. Paul, why are you persecuting me? Undeserving si Paul. By no means, ibibigay ko sa kanya. If I be, kung ako lang masusunod, hindi siya. Kasi nga, ang purpose niya is usigin ang church. Yet, Paul will be telling us that in some of his uh, epistles. So for now, ang sasabihin lang ni Apostle Pablo sa atin ay, through Jesus himself, we have received grace. Tumanggap tayo ng biyaya. Tumanggap tayo ng 
unmerited favor. Tumanggap tayo ng bagay that we don't deserve. Plus, apostleship. Being sent with a mission to bring about the obedience of faith. Nakakatuwa ito. Itong bagay na yan. To bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. Purpose is obedience of faith. Make that faith that you have move, work, obey for the sake of His name among all nations. And that includes you who are in Rome, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. These things are. These things are interesting, including those who have received grace and apostleship, those who, uh, those who are about to bring obedience of faith. Nakakatuwa itong mga bagay-bagay na ito. Kaya in verse 7, balikan ko lang yung mamaya ng kaunti. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Common greetings ay yung karis. For the Greeks, yan yung grace. At for the Jews, yung shalom which is peace. Kaya nakapaloob doon yung greetings niya both for the Greeks and for the Gentiles or for the Greeks and to the Jews. But not only that, mas malalim ang dating nito. Nung sabihin niya, grace to you, isang pagpapala yan. You don't deserve that, but it was given. Peace also. San galing ang peace? Peace from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Balikan ko lang ang verse 7. Oftentimes, nakakaligtaan natin yung word na yon or yung pagkatawag na yon. Those who are in Rome, be that whoever started the work there, whoever established the church there. Sabi ng Apostol Pablo, you are loved by God. That's one. The second one is that you are called to be saints. Now, may paliwanag ko na sa inyo yung saints. Uh, the term, the same term na called to be saints is evident also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 and 3. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified, separated in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, Together with all those who in every place, that includes Rome and other places, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. Both their Lord and ours. What Paul is trying to say is there is no difference between the Christians in Rome and the Christians in Jerusalem. There is no difference between the Christians of old and the Christians of today. Their Lord and ours. All of us have been separated, sanctified, made holy. We've been called to be saints. Sanctified, holy, separated. The same word. Naglalaro siya ng mga, ng mga words. Grace to you and peace, the same thing, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. Saints Hagios, holy. Called to be saints, called to be holy. Called to be holy, sanctos, sanctified. Holy din ang ibig sabihin nun. Play on word. Play on word. But the same thing. We are called saints. Hindi po mga patay yung mga saints. Sa banal na kasulatan, ang mga saints, ang mga sanctified, nahihiwalay o nakahiwalay, sanctos, sa Latin yun ay holy. Pero dito, interchangeably ginamit na Apostol Pablo. 
para ipakita ang tunay na kalagayan ng mga Kristiyano ng mga mananampalataya sa harapan ng Diyos. We have been called, we are sanctified, called to be saints, holy. Okay? Next one. Verse 8. As he starts his letter, Paul wrote, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Meaning, naririnig what you're doing, what you believe. Your faith is being proclaimed in all the known world. In all the entire empire. And he will continue to say, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, uh, I mention no always in my prayers. It was he who said, pray without ceasing, and he practiced what he preaches. Asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. It is evident that he longs to go to Rome. And it is also evident that he practiced what he preaches. Yet in all of this, even if he says, I prayed without ceasing, I continued on asking God, continually ask God that I could be allowed to see you in Rome. And even his appeal to appear before Caesar, God paved the way for him to reach Rome. So he still depend, depends on God's will. Verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Listen, that's singular. That I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Other would agree, others would argue that these are miraculous gifts. But whenever we talk about gifts or miraculous gifts, plural lag yon. Pero either it be a miraculous or non-miraculous gift or gifts. Look at this. That is that we may mutually encourage by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So Paul does not undermine the faith of his Roman brethren. He does not undermine the faith and he does not question whatsoever what kind of faith do these Romans have. He kept on saying so that we may be mutually encouraged. Not a one-way traffic, but a two-way traffic, a give and take. I could be an encouragement to you and you have been an encouragement to me. That, that sounds like fair. Mutual encouragement. 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you in so many times, but thus far have been prevented. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, because he is the apostle to the Gentiles and he wanted to be at the center of the empire, which is Rome. And he wanted to bring the gospel there. Although the gospel has already been brought there, but he wanted to be there also. He wanted to reap some harvests among the Romans. And here is how personal Paul is and how dedicated he is for his work. For I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Look at that. Under obligation. It is my obligation. It is my duty. <laughs> For Paul, it was. And he would say Philippians 1.16 that he is placed there for the defense of the gospel. And he would also say, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Look at this guy. His dedication to his work. His dedication being a servant at the master's own disposal sent with a mission, and then set apart 
he understands that. He knows fully well who he is and what his work is all about. So verse 15, and I'll just finish it with verse 17. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. As I have done to other places, as part of his obligation, to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish, he too is longing really to go to Rome. And then in verse 16 and verse 17, as what we have studied before or as what is being part of our key verse or verses in the book of Romans, Again, Paul made this. For I am not ashamed. There is nothing wrong about the gospel. But for the Greeks, a dead hero is a nothing. It's worth nothing. And he's preaching a dead but resurrected hero. So Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. It is the dunamis of God. It is the dynamite of God. Yung power that ginamit doon, the power that is being used there in Greek is dunamis, where our term dynamite comes from. It is God's dynamo, God's power, God's dynamite for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Starting to faith from faith, finishing it with faith. From faith to faith. We have discussed that in our introduction. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And after that, we will be dealing with this next week. He will be showing the Romans that the Greeks are guilty, the Jews are guilty, everyone is guilty before God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, either that be Greek or Jew, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. We will be discussing this next meeting. First and foremost, I'd really like to thank you. Thank you so much for those who have been inquiring. Thank you so much for those who have been asking me uh, I was just a bit, <laughs> so a lot of things to do, so much that I would like, but just didn't find time. Again, brethren, thank you so much for being in this broadcasts.